Um, okay, I, before starting my talk, um, I checked the schedule for uh, both chess and crypto, and since that, this is the only talk about curve based cryptography. So I wonder how many of you have heard of uh, curve based cryptography. Can you raise your hand? Okay, <laughs> some of you. Okay, let me. Anyway, let me begin with the uh, background of uh, code-based crypto first. So uh, code-based crypto is a branch of uh, post-content crypto. And right now, I think that uh, the situation is um, we have very confidence-inspiring uh, post-content signatures by using uh, hash-based signatures. But for encryption schemes, it thinks that uh, it's uh, either code-based or lattice seem to be uh, promising. So that's why we care about code-based crypto in the first place. Okay. Um, so as the name implies, uh, code-based crypto is based on coding theory. So let me give a, a small background about coding theory. So uh, in this talk, whenever I'm talking about a code, I mean a, a linear sub subspace of F2 to the n. Okay, and since it's a linear subspace, you can, of course, define it using a, um, the kernel space of matrix. And in this case, we call the matrix a parity check matrix, usually denoted by H. And one thing important in coding series that we want to do, um, well, error correction, want to do decoding. So let me define it first. Um, so you can view decoding using two definitions. So first one is that uh, you're given uh, a vector C plus E, where C is a code word and E is an error vector of small weight, like weight up to T or something. And your job is to recover E or C, or equivalently C. So. And another view of uh, decoding is that um, so you're given a so-called syndrome. Well, syndrome is a um, matrix vector product, so like H times E or H times C plus E. And your job is um, similar. You want to recover E in this case. Okay. So we have two different views of decoding. And what's code-based encryption about? Um, so basically, there are two. Um, two types of uh, encryption schemes, uh, either Macalis or Niederreiter. And each of these uh, correspond to one of the definitions I, I introduced in the previous slide. So for in the Macalis Mac setting, um, the plan text is going to be a code word, and your cipher text is going to be a, a cipher text plus some error. And of course, uh, you can see that if you want to recover the plan text, you have to do decoding. And in the need writer setting, uh, it uses the second definition. So the cipher text, uh, sorry. So the plan text is going to be an error vector. And then cipher text uh, is the syndrome corresponding to it. And then our job is to recover E, well, which is, again, uh, decoding. And please notice that uh, here I, I put a star on this uh, parity check, uh, check matrix edge uh, because oh, this is crypto scheme, so we want that the public key uh, do, do, not, uh, do not have the, the uh, structure of the code, uh, the underlying code. So we somehow like uh, scramble the parity check metric a little bit, and then this metric becomes our public key. Okay. But for the receiver who has uh, uh, a structured uh, parity check matrix edge, uh, he can do decoding, well, decoding and, uh, and thus uh, decryption. And that's roughly how it works. Okay. And in general, well, uh, code based encryptions are very simple in some sense because it just either use Macalis or Niederreiter uh, together with some code. And whether the skin is secure or not, uh, depends on which code you're using. Okay. So, of course, um, since uh, code-based crypto has been invented, t 
till now, um, many codes uh, have been proposed to be used for Cobase Crypto, but unfortunately, many of them have been uh, broken. But at least there are two noticeable codes that hasn't been uh, broken, and that's uh, binary GoPro code and QC and DPC code. So here I have a timeline. So um, the binary GoPro code. Uh, well, the use of binary code codes uh, in uh, Cobase Crypto was proposed in 1978. You can see it's uh, almost as old as uh, PolyKey Crypto, uh, very long time ago. And but for QC and DPC code, uh, it was just introduced in 2013. So you can see there's a very big gap between the confidence we have in these two codes. So now you may wonder, so, well, we already have this very confidence-inspiring uh, original mechanist crypto system using binary code barcode, then well, why, why we need to talk about QC and DBX code? Well, the, the issue here is that um, the original binary code barcode construction uses a very, very big public key, uh, around several hundreds of kilobytes, maybe. But uh, the benefit of using QC and DPC code is that the public key size reduced a lot. So now it becomes something like uh, several kilobytes only. So that's why people um, propose QC and DPC code. Okay. So um, of course, because of uh, the advantage QC and DPC code brings. Um, so after 2013 till now, many papers have been published to see like how efficient it can be on different platforms. Okay. And then this year, I, I well, I published this um, quick bit software written by myself. And the reason why I have this software is that um, all the previous. Uh, papers didn't really take care of the constant time issue. So for example, this uh, Piku Crypto 2014 paper, um, well, it provides some constant time operation like encryption and decryption, but um, it's on a platform that doesn't really have the cache. So you can see it's, um, it's a problem if we really want to deploy it, uh, this scheme. So, um, I wrote QuickBits, and QuickBits uh, provides constant time key generation, encryption, and decryption. So oh, everything is constant time. And it, it works for many platforms, not just well, platforms without caches. So essentially, uh, all reasonable 32 or 65, uh, 64 uh, bit platforms can be used. Okay. Um, now let's see some perform performance uh, results. So here I have a table for the 80-bit well, pre-content security parameter. And today I'll focus on the, um, the decryption. So let's see the decryption column. Um, so what's being shown here is basically that uh, QuickBits is well, much faster than previous uh, implementations. Well, either constant time or non constant time implementations. And this is because I'm doing computation in a very different way from the previous works. Okay. And you might have already noticed that I didn't show like higher security um, parameters. And this is because of some annoying issue of uh, failure rate. I couldn't achieve um, kind of good failure rate for higher security levels. So that's why I don't show here. But well, at the end of this talk, I'll come back to this issue again. Okay. So um, now let's take a look at what uh, this QC and DPC code is. Well, it's actually not as scary as the NAND file. So, um, so NDPC is just just means that uh, the parity checks metric is going to be sparse. Okay, there are not going to be many uh, non-zero entries in the 
clarity check matrix. And QC stands for uh, quasi cyclic. Um, this basically means that um, your clarity check matrix is going to be um, uh, content concatenation of uh, several square matrices, and each square matrix is uh, um, cyclic in the sense that uh, each row is going to be the previous row shifted by one position to the right. So here I have a simple example like here. So it's a parity track matrix with two blocks, two square matrix blocks. And one small thing you can see is that, okay, you can view it as a row shifted by one position or also column shifted by one position, doesn't really matter. Okay. And once have, we have this, um, this parity chunk matrix, then, oh, in order to build the whole system, we need to be able to decrypt, decrypt. And of course, in order to do that, we need to decode. So how can we decode QC and DPC code? Um, the algorithm is called uh, statistical, statistical decoding, or maybe you hear more, more frequently uh, the bit flipping algorithm. And um, so this algorithm um, runs like um, many, many iterations. You repeat the uh, iteration many times until success. And uh, at the beginning, what we do is to start with some vector C, uh, uh, C plus E. For example, in the Macaulay setting, well, this is just your ciphertext, okay? Um, and then the first step in each iteration is that you compute the syndrome, compute the syndrome HV, some syndrome here. And then the next step is that uh, you try to see which of the entries in the syndrome are ones. And then you pick the corresponding rows and then you add them together to form a, a vector U. And please know that uh, here the addition is performing uh, the integer ring, okay? And at this moment, I claim that the higher uh, the entries in, in, the, uh, in U is, uh, the higher the probability that the corresponding uh, entry in V is in error. This is my claim. Okay. And then what, what we should do is, well, kind of clear if you assume this is right, because, well, um, you see some higher, uh, uh, larger entries here. And if it's larger, then we assume that it's more likely to be in error. So what we do is that uh, we flip the bits, uh, corresponding uh, bits in VI, if VI is large. Okay. And uh, we cannot guarantee that one iteration will success, so we have to do this um, well, several times. Okay. Um, if some of you know, actually know something about coding theory, you probably feel that this is a very weird uh, deco decoder. But let me try to explain the rationale behind this. So the rationale is that, uh, so for example, uh, here you see the parity uh, of zero. In this case, uh, the algorithm um, doesn't really, can, uh, the algorithm cannot really tell that uh, whether there are some entries corresponding to the, like, the ones here in B that's in the arrow. Well, it can be that those positions are not, uh, none of these positions are zero, right? Cannot really tell. So in some sense, uh, this gives us uh, no information at all. I mean, uh, for the algorithm. Okay, but for the case that uh, the parity is one, uh, actually this gives us some uh, small piece of information because uh, you know for sure that, for example, uh, the f in the first row, you know for sure that uh, either the, fir uh, the first entry or the third or uh, seventh or tenth entry in V you know at least one of this is in error, okay? 
of course, there can be more, but at least one is in error. So this gives us some information, although it's not a lot. Okay. And things, things, um, things that uh, we don't know which one is in error, so we basically uh, like give each position uh, like one score. Okay. So that's the rationale behind this algorithm. Okay. Um, so at this moment, let's think about how to perform the algorithm in constant time. So well, one, one obvious thing is that, of course, we want to like, have constant number of iterations. Well, that's very obvious. And let's not discuss this here. We just think about like, how to do each iteration in constant time. Okay. So, um, I think the obvious way, the straightforward way, is to uh, treat the whole matrix uh, as a dense matrix, and then just perform the dense matrix uh, operation, and then suddenly uh, becomes easily constant time. Okay, and that's basically uh, the previous works are doing. Well, it's not as simple as this, but basically like like this. But you can see that this is not that. In, um, satisfying, not that efficient, because, well, you see that uh, the parity check metric is very uh, highly structured, and it has many, non, uh, only a few non-zero entries here. So, well, what I did is very simple. I, I would like to make use of this sparsity. Um, and, of course, while I'm using this sparsity, I don't want to leak any information uh, to the adversary. For example, you cannot just uh, pick uh, the first entry, the third entry, seventh entry of, uh, of V, and then do the computation. Well, this is not constant time, okay? So, and the idea behind quick bits is, well, actually also quite simple. I basically consider everything as uh, polynomial uh, operations, okay? So, for example, the first step, in each iteration is uh, going to be syndrome computation. So now you see uh, we have two blocks of the parity check matrix. And we consider uh, the first column here as a polynomial in this ring uh, F2x modulo x to the n minus one. Okay. So a very, you can see easily that um, because uh, because we uh, try to view this as a polynomial, so uh, the second uh, column is going to be the first column uh, multiplied by x, and this is similar for the uh, remaining columns also. Uh, just each of them is the previous one multiplied by x. Okay, and then. When you do this multiplication, um, this uh, v's here becomes a, a coefficient of this uh, x, uh, power of x. So eventually it becomes, well, two polynomial multiplications in this ring. Okay, that's how I view syndrome computation as uh, polynomial operations. Okay. And how can we really uh, carry out this uh, polynomial multiplications, uh, well, first of all, you need to see that uh, this is, these are not generic uh, polynomials. So here, it's like we have a dense, uh, dense polynomial. Well, you can represent it as an array of 32 or 64 uh, bit words. And for f, uh, which is uh, sparse, we represent it using the non-zero uh, non terms. So like, uh, Whenever fi is one, we put it into this array. Okay, so we have an array of indices, and then you just um, compute vf as like x to the i one v, x to the i two v, and so on. Okay. Um, so each x y v is simply a rotation of v. It's easy to see, and in order to carry out the summation, you just need to do XOR because we work in GF2. Okay. 
So everything seems okay, but one remaining question is how can we do like is this rotation uh, constant time? If you don't do it carefully, then it wouldn't be constant time. So I still have to deal with this this issue. Okay. So well, the uh, what QuickBit uh, does is well actually using a very well-known technique, actually, it's called the barrel shifter. So for example, if we want to shift uh, the vector V by S positions, what we do is to view uh, S as uh, in its uh, binary expansion, S1, S2, S3, and so on, okay? And then uh, it's not so hard to imagine what's going on, so uh, we deal with the first bit here, okay? So uh, we first compute uh, v shifted by uh, L minus one positions. Okay, it's like assuming that S one is one. Okay, so now we have two uh, two results. So one uh, correspond to S uh, original S because S one is zero. One correspond to S one equal to one, and then we just uh, pick. Uh, we just select. Uh, one of them in constant time, okay, uh, uh, depending on what S1 is, okay. This is not so hard to do. And then to do with the remaining bits, well, it's just similar, you also, okay, just shift it by some values correspond to the second bit, and then you pick in constant time this uh, two values, okay, and so on. And eventually you will have uh, V shifted by S, okay. Okay, and the next, uh, sorry, the second step in each iteration of the uh, decoding ocean is going to be the uh, com computation of U, okay. Um, so in this case, uh, we have similar situation. So yeah, you have syndrome here, parity check matrix here. And we also do something similar, like uh, we consider uh, each row here as a polynomial, but this time in uh, zx <coughs> modulo x to the n minus one. So we no, no longer works in the binary field, okay? And then you can see that uh, if you still remember uh, how we compute u, um, we actually pick uh, uh, the rows correspond, correspond to one here. And you can translate this into like a this multiplied by this row, this multiplied by this row, and then we just sum all of this up together, okay? So again, you see the same uh, similar pattern, like um, S0 becomes the uh, constant term, S1 becomes a coefficient of this x, and so on. So eventually, it becomes polynomial multiplication again, so like um, this time S F and SG. Um, yeah, so at this moment you can imagine that uh, we can also use the uh, constant time rotation, the barrel shifter uh, technique um, to do this. But uh, one thing that's different is that we, are, we no longer work in uh, JEP2, we're working in the uh, integer ring. And that makes some small difference because we cannot use uh, XOR again. So how did I do this? So um, the <clears throat> most straightforward approach is to like, uh, so for example, you want to store B uh, entries of the vector U, and you just uh, store it in an array of B uh, bytes maybe. So here I'm assuming that each entry fits into like maybe six bits, okay? But of course, when you're writing your program, of course you don't have like six bits in the structure you have maybe bytes, okay. So the most natural, uh, most straightforward way is like uh, doing like this. So uh, you can imagine whenever we have a new XIS and want to add this into uh, this uh, bunches, bunches of uh, counters, so maybe we need like uh, B additions maybe. But we can actually do much better if we are doing uh, 
in a baselized way. So here you see that uh, I'm essentially transposing the whole matrix here. Okay, so now you have uh, six uh, bit bits words here. Okay. And then, try to finish up. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, you just do it in the baseline way. You mimic the addition circuits. Um, and then eventually, you see that um, for each addition here, you actually need uh, much, much less than uh, one addition instruction. Okay. So if you understand the idea, then similarly, you can compute the, uh, the bits that correspond to whether we need to flip the bits or not in a base slice way, okay? So this is my last slide, so um, I want to talk about the future of this game, actually. So there's actually some problem, like uh, the failure rate. Uh, we have some failure rate, like uh, 10 to the minus eight, to the 80. Yeah. Well, that doesn't sound very secure, but um, for all the implementations so far, it's also has similar problem. So uh, what I really hope is that some people can really uh, have some an analysis of uh, like how low the decoding failure should be in order to make this game competence inspiring. Okay, maybe like this paper. Maybe. Okay, that's all my talk and everything is put, uh, has been put in this uh, link. So if you are interested, please, uh, please check it out. Okay, thanks.